Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. You will hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course, and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S H U three zero zero. 715PG SHU 300715PG Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 4 to 6. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week, and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube, located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. So, The Cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two-bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Hmm. I will have to think about this. Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine. Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a radio program in which the manager of the Apollo Leisure Center is interviewed about the center. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen to the first part of the interview and answer questions 11 to 16. Next, I'd like to welcome Carol Brown, manager of the Apollo Leisure Centre. Carol, welcome. Thank you. Now, Carol, the Apollo seems a familiar sight, but how long has it actually been here? Well, we started negotiations to take over the previous Active Life Centre that used to occupy the premises mm -hmm. in 2000 and planned to open in 2001, although the usual delays meant it was 2002 before we were up and running. Mm. And do you have quite a mix of members or are you focused on certain groups? It's pretty broad, actually. There are something like 200 adult members, so that's our biggest group, but we also have as many as 100 youth members, together with about 50 family group members, and I think we'll see that section growing to 100 over the next couple of years. Healthy numbers. Yes, and we'll be developing the centre to make it even more attractive. We're hoping eventually to build in a rock climbing wall which would make a useful addition. We've already opened our swimming pool which is hugely popular and we'll have a massage room open within 12 months. Now, I understand you have different categories of membership? Yes, to suit every pocket. Blue membership includes all facilities for the member and a guest at all times, which is good for people with unpredictable timetables. If you can make it during daytime hours, red membership gives you excellent returns for your fee. As for only half price, you can use all the facilities during the day, and they're actually less crowded then. Green membership is designed for people who are only able to come infrequently, and so, of course, costs less. And there are chances to socialise. Oh, certainly. Our cafe is very popular and is a nice place to wind down and chat after working out or whatever. In fact, while it used to shut at 8, we've extended that to 9 now, with last orders taken at 8.30. It serves a whole range of food and drink. Mm. So, if someone wants to join, what do they do? Come and see us. Mm. We'll give you all the details. The induction process takes about an hour and a quarter, which includes three quarters of an hour on average with a personal trainer and something like half an hour being shown round the different facilities. So we'd be well looked after? Definitely. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 17 to 20. OK, now, Carol, can you give us some idea of what we could expect to get as members of Apollo? Sure. Well, let's take next Monday as an example. Mm -hmm. The early evening would begin with the programme of classes. Of course, members would also be at liberty to do their own thing, I'm just talking about the listed classes that we'll be offering. Uh -huh. So let's say you're free to turn up at 4pm. You could spend an hour in a class that we call gentle exercise. This isn't a hard workout, as you might be imagining it, but a session designed for those who perhaps are not used to rigorous classes and would like something to ease them in. Right. The next thing on offer will be starting at 5, and again, it'll last for an hour. In contrast, this is what we simply call weightlifting. 
It's certainly not for softies, but this strenuous session is, of course, carefully monitored and we wouldn't let anyone do anything silly. Oh, well, that's reassuring. And then, kicking off at quarter past six, you'll be welcome at a class aimed at promoting better lifestyles, which we run under the banner of Healthy Living. We'll give you all sorts of useful advice about just living better. Oh, sounds easier than working out. And probably at least as important. And rounds the evening off nicely. Oh, no, we still have one more offering. Oh. These days, so many people are working, frankly, more than they should be. And we try to combat the stress that that creates by encouraging those who can to take part in the class we call relaxation. You can learn lots of helpful techniques for staying calm when you think everything's going terribly. Now you're talking. So we'll see you on Monday. Ah, now... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student, Alex, asking his tutor for advice about essay writing. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 21 to 27. Hi, Alex. Come in. I gather you wanted some help with writing essays. Yes. I'm finding this first term difficult, and I'm worried about the assignments we have to do for January. Well, let me see if I can help. You shouldn't panic about it, because essay writing is a very straightforward process, really. What it involves is organising the information that you want to include. You shouldn't have more than you can easily manage within the word count. Make sure you haven't got too much or anything irrelevant. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to look at that and work out what you need and what you don't need before you start. And then you just have to think about how you're going to put forward your argument. Oh, that sounds very straightforward when you put it like that. <laughs> but I'm worried I haven't got the necessary skills for writing an effective essay because English is my second language. Mm. Well, perhaps you misunderstand the skills you need. You need to be able to analyse your data and then I would say the skills of interpretation and expressing yourself are important. Perhaps it's this last one that bothers you, but the more essays you write, the more you will develop these skills. Yes, and I don't quite know how to improve at that. Though, as you say, I know practice will help. Mm. And I need to make sure I've got everything ready before I start. Yes. What is vital to good essay writing is preparation, so make sure you build in enough time to do the research you need. Are there any other sources I can use to help me with essays? Yes. You should go to the library and look through the reference section, because there are books that focus on the style we use in academic writing, and those will help you a lot. The other thing that you should think about is what happens when you've actually written your essay. 
Too many students just complete their work and hand it in, whereas what you should be doing is making sure that you edit it as thoroughly as possible. Oh, yes, that's a good idea. Then I'd pick up any mistakes and also see if it reads logically. Exactly. Uh, the other thing is, again, what a lot of students do is get their essays back, look at the marks, then just file it away. Hmm. They don't realise that if they checked it through and looked at what the tutor had written, then they can learn from their old essays. Yeah, I can see that's a good idea. So, is that okay? You can always come back to me. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 28 to 30. Actually, there were a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about essay writing. Uh -huh. I had had a few thoughts of my own about what I should do, such as really taking good notes when I'm reading, because that helps, doesn't it? Mm, I think it improves your knowledge rather than your actual writing. Uh, but one tip I can give you is to try and not read too much. Otherwise, you end up including irrelevant material in your essay. Remember to stay on task. Yes. Sometimes I have problems interpreting the questions correctly. Or the whole question seems overwhelming to me. Mm. What I try to do is highlight the key parts and divide it into smaller chunks so I can manage it. Well, you might find it useful to break it down even further by making sure you understand all the words perfectly before you start. Uh, things like assess or comment and such like. Yes, I see. Sometimes, after an objective analysis, the question actually asks you for a subjective opinion. But you must remember to support your arguments, if that's the case. Mm. Um, one final comment I can make is about using your own words. You must try to do this as far as possible. You're expected to summarise what you've read, not just string together a list of quotations. In fact, you shouldn't have too many. Just use them where it's really important. OK, thanks. Do you read other students' essays when you've finished? No. Why? Is that a good idea? Well, you can confuse each other, so I'd advise against it. But it's up to you. OK. Uh, thanks very much for your time. And that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T-Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum, and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact. Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes but it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So, given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the earth for a long time and the longer the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily. And being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years in fact one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time, although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.